Greetings, Seco Nerdlings. In this podcast, we're going to be discussing disease in developed and developing countries. So what are some of the risks and hazards? Well, a risk is a measure of the likelihood that you will suffer harm from a hazard. And we can suffer from biological hazards, chemical hazards, physical hazards, as well as cultural hazards. Biological hazards have more than 1,400 different types of pathogens that can affect us. Uh, chemical hazards include uh, different types of pathogens that we can find in the air, the water, the soil, and our food that we eat. Physical hazards include fires, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, uh, mudslides, things like that. And then cultural hazards include different types of uh, activities such as smoking, poor diet, unsafe sex, illegal drug use, unsafe working conditions, as well as poverty. So let's look at biological hazards, uh, which are disease in developed and developing countries. So diseases not caused by living organisms cannot spread from one person to another, and those are called non-transmittable diseases. Uh, the only caveat to that is excluding viruses. Uh, viruses are not considered living, but they are transmittable. So uh, while those caused by living organisms, such as bacteria, can actually spread from person to person. Those are called transmissible infectious diseases. And again, a virus is an infectious disease. Even though it's not living, it is still an infectious disease along with the bacteria as well. So there are different types of ways that diseases are transmissible or transmitted. So we can transmit them from person to person, from mother to infant. Uh, we can get them from pets, livestock, wild animals, uh, different types of insects such as mosquitoes, fleas, ticks, uh, the food that we eat if it's been contaminated, uh, as well as the water and air if those are polluted with different types of chemicals as well. So some transmissible diseases. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates that each year the world's seven deadliest infections kill about 13 million people and most of them are in the poor and developing countries. So there's about 3.2 million deaths that occur due to pneumonia and the flu, which are common bacteria and viruses, about 3 million for HIV AIDS, 2 million die of malaria, about 2 million die of diarrheal diseases caused by bacteria and viruses, uh, 1.7 million are due to uh, tuberculosis, which is a bacterial disease, uh, hepatitis B accounts for about 1 million deaths a year, and the measles virus accounts for about 800,000 deaths per year. So looking at the case study, the growing global threat from tuberculosis. This is a very highly infectious tuberculosis which kills 1.7 million people per year. And it could kill up to 25 million people by the year of 2020. Recent increases in tuberculosis are due to the lack of tuberculosis screening and control programs especially in the developing countries because it is expensive to do all of the tuberculosis testing. Uh, also to genetic resistance to the most effective antibiotics. So people who get tuberculosis typically get treated with a specific type of antibiotic. Well now that antibiotic is starting to not work because that bacteria from the tuberculosis is starting to become resistant to those antibiotics. So what are some of the viral diseases that affect humans? Well, some of the most common ones that you guys have probably all heard about are the flu, HIV, and hepatitis B. These infect and kill more people each year than the highly publicized West Nile virus and the SARS viruses. The influenza virus is the biggest killer virus worldwide, and it can be transmitted many different ways. So the virus can actually transmit from one species to another. Uh, this could include pigs, chickens, ducks, and geese. Those are the major reservoirs of the flu. And they move from one species to the next because they can mutate and exchange genetic material with other viruses. So HIV is the second biggest killer virus worldwide. There are five major priorities that are instated to slow the spread of the disease. And these are to number one, quickly reduce the number of new infections to prevent further spread of the disease. Uh, we want to concentrate on the groups in a society that are likely to spread the disease. We also would like to provide free HIV testing and pressure people to actually get tested who were probably exposed to the virus or might, might carry it. 
Um, implementing educational programs would also help to prevent the spread of HIV, as well as providing free or very low cost drugs to help slow the progress of the disease itself. So another case study is malaria or death by mosquito. Malaria kills about 2 million people per year, and it's probably killed more than all of the wars ever fought on earth combined. So malaria is uh, basically a type of disease that you get from a mosquito who's been infected. So right here you see a female mosquito. The female mosquito will bite an infected human ingesting blood that contains plasmodium gametocytes. So it bit somebody who's already infected basically. So now this mosquito becomes a vector or a carrier of the disease. So the plasmodium develop in the mosquito. The mosquito injects the plasmodium sporozytes into a human host. So those sporozytes penetrate the liver of the host into the merozyte. The merozytes enter the bloodstream and then they develop into gametocytes, causing the malaria and making the infected person a new reservoir and very, very sick. Now, some people have actually developed a natural biological defense to this, and that is called sickle cell anemia. Now, sickle cell anemia can actually be very detrimental to people, but people who live in areas where the malaria virus is very prevalent, if they are a heterozygote, meaning that they have uh, one allele that is the sickle cell anemia trait and one allele which is a normal blood cell, so sickle cells look like this, like a sickle, and our normal red blood cells are kind of like a little disc. Uh, the reason for that is because it takes the life cycle of that plasmodium a lot longer uh, than the sickle cells live. So sickle cells in the blood basically um, go through the cycle and they die I want to say, I believe about every 80 days, whereas normal blood cells, I want to say, last for about 120 days. Well, the life cycle of the malaria parasite lives for 100 days. So if that person has sickle cell anemia, those cells are dying and being replaced every 80 days, so it doesn't have enough time to actually fully develop and kill the person. So anyways, little caveat there. So back to AP biology that... Some of you may have had. Uh, so spraying insides of homes with low concentrations of the pesticide of DDT greatly reduces the number of malaria cases. However, we have found that DDT is very detrimental to the environment. So under the international treaty enacted in 2002, DDT is being phased out in the developing countries. So what about ecological medicine and infectious diseases? Well, mostly because of human activities, infectious diseases are moving at increasing rates from one animal species to another, including us. Ecological or conservation medicine is devoted to tracking down these connections between wildlife and humans to determine ways to actually slow and prevent the spread of the diseases. So next we're going to discuss chemical hazards. So a toxic chemical can cause temporary or permanent harm or death to humans, as well as plants and other animals. So we have different types of chemicals. We have mutagens. These are chemicals or forms of radiation that can cause an increase in the frequency of mutations in our DNA. We have teratogens. These are chemicals that can cause harm or birth defects to a fetus or an embryo. And we also have carcinogens. These are chemicals or types of radiation that can cause or promote cancer. So if you've ever worked in a research lab or just done a lab in biology or chemistry, you might have looked at some of the bottles and you might have actually seen some of these warnings or words on them. They might have said uh, mutagenic or a tetragen or carcinogen. And that's basically warning you that that type of chemical can cause those type of results. It could cause mutations or it could cause birth defects. It is a potential cancer hazard. So those are different types of things you should watch out for. Uh, and things you should look for on labels if you're doing any type of lab. So a hazardous chemical can harm humans or other animals for several different reasons. Number one, might be flammable, uh, it could be explosive, it could be an irritant, it can interfere with our oxygen uptake, and it can induce allergic reactions. 
so what are the effects of chemicals on the immune, nervous, and endocrine system? Well, long-term exposure to some chemicals at low doses can disrupt the body's different types of systems. So looking at the different systems that we're going to discuss, we have immune, nervous, and endocrine. Our immune system is composed of specialized cells and tissues that protect the body against disease and harmful substances. Our nervous system is composed of our brain, our spinal cord, as well as our peripheral nervous system and peripheral nerves. And then we have our endocrine system, which is a complex network of glands that release minute amounts of hormones into our bloodstream. So if chemicals affect any of these main systems that are involved in signaling and getting things across uh, in our body and helping to maintain homeostasis, it can definitely affect our health and in some times, in some substance, or excuse me, in some instances, it can actually result in our death because these are the three systems that interact together to maintain homeostasis in our body. So we're going to look at another case study called A Black Day in Bhopal, India. This is the world's worst industrial accident occurred in 1984 at a pesticide plant in Bhopal, India. An explosion at the Union Carbide pesticide plant in an underground storage tank released a large quantity of highly toxic methyl isocyanate, which is a gas. About 15 to 22,000 people were estimated to have died because of this pesticide chemical uh, contamination. Indian officials claimed that simple upgrades could have prevented the tragedy. So assessing chemical hazards. Factors determining the cause caused by exposure to a chemical include the amount of exposure or the dose that somebody receives, the frequency of the exposure to that chemical, the person who is exposed, and the effectiveness of the body's detoxification systems, as well as one's genetic makeup. So everybody kind of responds differently to different chemicals. Uh, one person might be completely fine, whereas another person might have a severe reaction and trouble breathing, rapid heart rate, uh, different types of reactions like that based on their genetic makeup. Children are actually the most susceptible to the effects of toxic substances because they breathe more air, drink more water, and they eat more food per unit of body weight than us adults do. They're exposed to toxins whenever they put their fingers and objects in their mouth that they've touched. And children usually have less well-developed immune systems as well as detoxification processes than adults do. So looking at the risk analysis here, this chart shows annual deaths in the United States from tobacco use as well as other causes in the year of 2003. So looking at deaths in the United States, almost half a million people died because of tobacco use. About 100,000 died for accidents, and about 43,000 of those were automobile accidents. Uh, alcohol use accounted for 85,000 deaths. Infectious diseases, about 75,000. 16,000 of those uh, coming from AIDS. And then pollutants or toxins actually killed 55,000 people in the United States. Uh, suicides were at 31,000 approximately, homicides about 21,000, and then illegal drug use around 17,000. So to kind of put things in perspective, looking at this chart, it tells us the number of deaths per year in the world from various causes. The parentheses show deaths in terms of the number of a fully loaded 400 passenger jumbo jet crashing every day the year with no survivors. So basically these red numbers right here are saying that poverty, malnutrition, and disease cycle account for 11 million deaths worldwide. That is the equivalent of 75 400 passenger jumbo jets crashing into the earth having no survivors every single day. And that's what it would tally up to. Uh, tobacco accounts for 5 million deaths a year, pneumonia and the flu about 3.2 million, air pollution 3 million, HIV AIDS 3 million, uh, the malaria disease 2 million deaths per year, diarrhea again about 2 million per year, tuberculosis accounts for 1.7 million deaths a year, automobile accidents occur or account for 1.2 million deaths a year, uh, Work-related injuries, as well as hepatitis B, account for about a million a year. And then the measles account for about 800,000 a year in deaths. So perceiving risk. 
Most individuals evaluate their relative risk they face based on the degree of control they have over that risk, fear of the unknown, whether we or they voluntarily take that risk or whether it's forced upon them, whether the risk is catastrophic, an unfair distribution of the risk, and sometimes misleading information as well as denial and irrational fears can actually cloud judgment about perceiving the risk of what might account for different types of deaths and things like that. So looking at this chart, it shows a risk analysis and it gives us a comparison of risks that people face expressed in terms of shorter averages in their lifespan. So the big factors looking at this are poverty, kind of decreases your lifespan by about seven to 10 years. If you're male, it decreases your life by about seven and a half years. If you're a smoker, it can decrease your lifespan six to 10 years. If you're overweight or considered obese, it can cause you to lose about six years off of your life. If you're unmarried, it can cause you to lose about five years. And then again, if you're overweight by about 15%, it can cause you to lose about two years off your life. Well, I hope that was helpful. You can rewatch this video and find many more on my website at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off. Stay nerdy till next time.